Welcome to Pep Talks. We're so happy that you're here tonight. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with our program. We just can't wait. It should be a wonderful evening. We just want to uh, welcome you. And we'll start just by introducing you to the student services staff. Um, we are led by Daniel Townsley, and he is not with us tonight on this call, but he is definitely our fearless leader and everything we do in our guidance uh, department is because of Daniel. And my name is Jenna Snyder. I am the Director of Guidance Counseling and the Upper School Guidance Counselor. And also on the call tonight is Dr. Lana Sneer, and she is our South Campus Counselor. She does a fantastic job. If you have little ones over at that campus, you know how valuable Lana is. Uh, Lana, if you will open us up in prayer tonight. Absolutely. Dear Lord, Father, we First off, we just want you to know that we love you and that we are so grateful to call you father and to feel the comfort that comes with being your child. And father, we ask you um, to just be with us this night, that Lord, that you will speak to each of us right where we need, that you will press on our hearts the message that you would have us to hear. We thank you for your faithful servant, Dr. Chapman, and the, the message that he has prepared and plans to bring tonight. Father, we thank you that he is obedient to your call and that he has the wisdom and the heart to speak truth and love, Lord. We are just grateful for him. And we thank you again, Father, for an opportunity to just, even in a time like COVID, to be together, to... Um, not only learn more about how to parent, Lord, but just to join together as a family and walk this journey all together. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Lana. All right. Well, I have the privilege of introducing to you Dr. Kenneth Chapman. And I heard him first at a faculty uh, in service where he brought us a message and I thought he is fantastic. I definitely want to have uh, parents be able to hear, hear him. So we're thrilled he's with us tonight. I'll tell you a little bit about Dr. Chuck. He is the executive dean of liberal arts at Dallas Community College and former senior director of equity and inclusion at the University of Oklahoma. He also does a little bit of diversity work, at, or maybe a lot of diversity work, actually, at Dallas Community College as well. And he, in addition to that, is the pastor of Life Changing Faith Christian Fellowship right here in the heart of Frisco. Um, Dr. Chapman has five children, four boys, and one little girl. They just had a little girl, so that's been a lot of fun. She is six months old today, too, we just learned. So um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Chapman. Yeah, you're sounding good. Right, you can hear me. You can see my screen. Okay, thank you, Jenna, for that kind introduction. Um, so as uh, Jenna said, and I'm Dr. Kenneth Chapman, and I'll tell you a little bit about me. So. Uh, worked in higher education most of my life. All of my research has been in kingdom diversity at Christian institutions. That's where most of my work has been. Um, you see the picture of the four boys there, um, Kenneth, Cole, Carter, and Carson. Um, and then we added a baby girl about six months ago, who is the queen. I need to update the pictures here. Um, but just excited to be with you all tonight. And as Jenna said, I'm also a pastor, one of the teaching pastors, associate pastors at Life Changing Faith downtown Frisco, 7185. So if you enjoy me tonight, come hear us online or come check us out uh, when we're back in person in downtown Frisco. Um, so I always give a disclaimer at the beginning of my talks, uh, conversations, um, that I am a third generation preacher. Uh, I'm a preacher's kid, a Baptist preacher at that. So if I get happy when I get to talk in scripture, uh, leave me alone and I'll take up an offering when we're done. Uh, but glory be to God. So I want to jump in tonight to the topic of, you know, social emotional identity, uh, Christian identity uh, with our children and how do we navigate um, differences and understanding difference among our children. Um, so clearly we want to have a foundation. And the first foundational piece is, you know, what does the Bible say about difference? Um, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, there's a different kinds of spirit, different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit, right? Different kinds of service, but the same Lord. 
uh, different kinds of workings, but in all of them, it is God, the same God at work. And so God loves diversity. God loves difference. Uh, that's why we have different trees. And uh, that's why we all have different uh, shapes and sizes, because God loves, you know, difference and creating things different. There's no monolithic uh, piece about us. That's why he created us different for his glory. Uh, one of the things that encourages me uh, for us to celebrate our difference is that no matter who we are and how we were created, uh, when God calls us all together uh, at the great celebration, we will worship our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, and the great gospel is the equalizer. So whether you're raised rich or poor, uh, white or black, whatever background you come from, the gospel equalizes all that because we were all sinners um, saved by a dying Savior called Jesus. Um, Another thing about diversity and difference is that our Great Commission, God tells us to go teach and preach the gospel to all nations. And so whosoever will, let them come. It is God's will that none should perish. Um, and then there is neither Greek nor Jew, uh, right? Neither slave nor free. There's no male, female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. So as I talk about difference tonight, um, I want you to understand that God doesn't, is not a respecter of person, right? You're either saved or not saved, right? When we get to heaven, it's not going to be what denomination you were. It was not going to be how tall you were or what race you were. It was, did you love my son, Jesus? Did you not? So once I have that foundation, then we can talk about our babies and how to navigate that social emotional context with our babies. And if you can't say anything at all, say amen. That's the quickest way to get a pastor to say, uh, be quiet. Uh, so social emotional development, right? So research shows that firsthand how important it is for our children to feel secure, uh, valued, and cared, uh, and develop strong social emotional skills. And that's just natural, being a parent of five children and parents out there. You can tell when you know your, your child is engaged, um, when you have that, that moment of connectivity um, through the different interactions that you do, when you tell them I'm proud of you or when you hug them. Um, I think of Gary Chapman's five love languages. You know, I know each one of my children's love language. There's some when I discipline them, I have to talk to them when they respond. Uh, some I have to hold their hand to get them to understand what I'm trying to uh, tell them, you know, because they each respond differently. That's connected to the social emotional development. Um, the partnership in children's lives during a period of the critical emotional growth, that partnership is the church, um, it's the school, it's legacy, um, it's the counselors at the school, it's the teachers, it's a partnership that we're pouring into our children as they establish these social and emotional connections. Um, and then the social emotional development includes the children's experience, their expression and management of those emotions, the social behaviors, classroom behaviors, all that together equates to social emotional development. And so um, I started with kind of the biblical background, right? That God loves diversity. So now we're going to go through kind of the social emotional development piece. And then I'll add a layer onto that of the, how do we express, understand difference and express difference. And so hopefully it'll make sense as we kind of progress to the end. And so what I want you to understand from this is that the social emotional development that our children go through is happening every day in every interaction. Um, and so once we are keen on that, we can be mindful of how we develop them socially and emotionally. So there's three stages. Um, there's the acting, you know, they behave in socially appropriate ways that foster learning. There's the feeling, the understanding their emotions and regulations of their own emotions. Um, then there's the thinking, you know, they regulate their attention and, and their thought. Um, and so I don't deal with, you know, uh, babies in K through 12. I deal with 18 to 21 year olds, which, I will tell you some of them have issues with this even at that age coming out of college and a university. And I know some adults for that matter who struggle with these. Uh, but what I want you to understand is that we're all in charge of our own emotions and our own social identity. And so once we understand that, then we could add on our Christian identity lens to understand how God sees us is how we should see ourselves. And so as your child develops and, and encounters uh, differences, differences in classmates, differences in family members, differences um, whether they want chicken nuggets or um, a chicken actually on the bone, right? Because I've had that fight today at dinner. Um, they are navigating the emotional aspect of that difference. And so that's what we got to be mindful of, the acting, the feeling, and the thinking. So just to kind of go a little bit deeper, acting is the examples of behavioral self-regulation, um, interacting with teachers and peers in a positive way, um, feeling, you know, the emotional understanding, the self-regulation that it includes, like I feel a certain way, but that doesn't mean I act a certain way because I feel angry or feel a certain way. I encounter difference. So how do I navigate that difference? Um, thinking, you know, understanding that my attention on a lesson or activity is focused and that I'm gathering the information 
And so all these three of these areas are elements of social emotional development. So um, and the importance of authentic self in society, when we talk about difference, um, there are often times when you know, we feel like we can't live out our true identity as believers, as Christians. And so as we develop our babies and our children, um, we want them to be proud of, uh, godly proud of who they are as believers, right? Godly proud that they can tell their testimony that we are saved by grace through faith. But oftentimes, social identity allows people to be part of groups and gain a sense of belonging in the social world. Um, that's by way of, you know, fraternity or sorority organizations, by uh, athletic teams, things of that nature, by where we go to church. We have these social groups that we're a part of that creates a sense of belonging. But what we want to instill in our babies as it relates to social emotional development is that being a Christian is a group, a body of believers that is something that we can be proud of as well. And that identity should shape all our other identities. Um, I'm not a, a PhD, a dean, professor, faculty member, and then a believer. I'm a believer first who just so happens to work in higher education. That is my sole first identity. I'm not just African-American man uh, living in Frisco, Texas. I'm a believer who happens to be African-American and live in Frisco, Texas. And so what we want to instill through the social emotional process is that their sole first identity is a believer, as a Christian, uh, saved by grace through faith in Christ. And then all their other identities follow that they're secondary to that. Um, the more people identify with a particular group, uh, the more that group plays a role in shaping how they feel about themselves. Um, and so I think in terms of athletic teams, you know, uh, or a band, you know, one band, one sound, you know, you're often told to kind of have group think and think together. And that's great for teamwork and for team building, but we want to uh, make sure that our babies understand through this social emotional development process that they understand that their identity, while individual in Christ, part of a larger group of believers, uh, is important. And that identity helps shape who they are as they go through life, as they become uh, pick a career profession, as they pick a spouse, future spouse, as they pick a church. You know, it helps shape them. And so that's why we want through the social emotional development process, as they're starting to discover differences and bias, which we'll talk about here in a second, we want them to firmly commit to their identity as a Christian. Being a member of a certain group is important because how a person regards themselves and their abilities gaining status within the group. Um, so beautifully, and as believers, neither one of us are better than the other. Um, God sees us all the same, right? Um, we were all sinners, we were all saved, and so we want to instill in our children that God sees us all the same, but loves us uniquely um, based on our differences. So I have five children, four boys, one girl. Um, I love them all the same. I don't have favorites, um, although that little baby girl has my heart, but I won't tell my boys that. I don't have favorites, but I love them uh, individually for the uniqueness that they have, but I love them all the same, no favorites. And so that's kind of what we're after as my Christian identity, God sees that and he explores that, uh, allows me to explore my Christian identity as I develop my other identities. And so in essence, it's okay to be a Christian, be your authentic self in society. It doesn't give me a license to judge or to be a negative towards someone, but it does give me a right to be proud that I've been saved by the grace that God has given me. So it's okay to be a Christian and allow those Christian groups to help me form my other identities. I hope that makes sense to everyone. So there's a children's book that I use um, and I forgot my peacock feathers. Um, they're somewhere around here. Um, but are you a peacock or a penguin? Um, and it's a children's book. Um, and we talk there, it's the, the peacock goes to the land of the penguins um, and he's out of place. And when he's there in the penguins, he finds out that his uh, outer exterior is different than the penguins. He can't slide on the ice because the penguins exterior is different than his. He has longer feathers um, and penguins are black and white. Peacocks have all these beautiful colors. And so he feels out of place. And so he left home because he didn't feel like he was valued at home. So he left home, went to the land of the penguins and then got to the land of the penguins and figured, and found out that they all think alike and they all do the same thing and discovered that he loves his difference. And because he is different, that he could bring something of value to his original community, uh, which was the land of the peacocks. And so he goes back home um, and it's a great story. We read it once a week in my house, um, but he goes back home and then he appreciates how he was made. And so I dare my children always, you know, if be a peacock, you know, if you like something that is not the norm, uh, as long as it lines up with our Christian conviction in our house, 
that first identity, it's okay. It's okay not to like football and to like some other, other sport. It's okay not to like uh, butter pecan ice cream and like something that's completely off the wall. Those things are okay because those differences, God created difference uh, for celebration and for enjoyment. And so it's okay to be different and be you because God loves difference and God created us uh, to be different in order, one, for his glory, but two, for our benefit to learn and grow from each other. And so are you a peacock or a penguin? My parents in the room think in your own spaces. You know, I was pre-law in undergrad, but I found out I hated uh, writing. Um, I was pre-med, found out I hated blood. Um, and then I ended up being a communications major. And I did not want to become a pastor because I was going to be a third generation. I did everything I could to run from it. But I found out that I was a peacock and I needed to be true to who I was. And so I tried everything else, but it didn't work. And so it's okay to be a peacock. And you may have that own story, that own testimony that you tried something different and realize that you had to be true to who God called you to be for his glory and for the benefit of those uh, that you serve and work around. So bias um, is defined as it's an unconscious thing that happens. We all have bias, no one is immune from it. And basically what it is that we have a comfort level with certain things. Um, if I go to a conference at work, I'm gonna sit by individuals who uh, I know because I don't know anyone else at the conference. Uh, when we go to lunch together, I want to go to lunch with someone who is, I'm comfortable with. Uh, we all have bias. Oftentimes, when we encounter difference, we're biased towards something uh, because we don't understand it or because it's different than what we're used to. When it's a positive reaction, it's a preference. When it's negative, it's a bias. But we all have bias. No one is immune from it. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's bad when we treat someone different um, because of their difference. Um, we should always, always be mindful of how our language and our interactions treat others because, again, our number one identity is a Christian. So as the word says, let our light so shine before men so that others may see that our good works to glorify our Father in heaven. And so difference, while it's out there, we can tend to either be comfortable with it or biased towards it, depending on uh, our interaction with it. And so I'm going to show you kind of how that works here in a second. So when we talk about social emotional development, we talk about the biblical definition of difference um, and diverse, uh, diversity of things in our world, social emotional development. Now we're talking about our babies who are experiencing difference. Um, are they learning bias? Are they learning preference? Things of that nature. So we wanna be mindful of that. So we all have a bias. Um, sooner born, sooner bred, and when I die, I'll be sooner dead. That is my mantra. Um, if there are any other Sooners uh, on the line tonight, please. Um, shout me out. I love my Sooners. I, it's ingrained in me to love OU. I worked at OU. I went to OU. Um, and UT Austin is a great school. Um, they just can't win a football game in the second week of October. But that's neither here nor there. We'll pray for them. But that's a bias, right? Because of the environment that I came in, the environment that I was in. That's a bias. Not right, wrong, or indifferent. UT Austin is great, so I have colleagues that went there. But that's a bias. So because it's different, I'm biased towards it. Likewise, as our children are learning differences, are they treating things different because of a real uh, bias or preference or real information? So as a dean, when I hire faculty, uh, when they have UT Austin on their resume, I might be biased towards it because I came from OU and it's ingrained in me to not like Texas. So I need to be aware of that, if that makes sense to everyone. So it's bias, we all have it. Mac versus PC, uh, we're all biased. Either you have a Mac or you have a PC, right? Um, Mac users, you have to have special equipment to make things work. PC, I can just plug in my PowerPoint and it works, but we all have a bias or a preference. Um, and I put this in here, I don't have either one because I have five kids and I picked the two worst professions uh, that I'll never be a millionaire in, which is pastoring and education, right? Uh, but I hear that one drives better than the other, but we all have a bias or a preference in what we pr prefer to drive. Um, we all have a bias. Uh, I am a Kansas City Chiefs fan. Unfortunately, that didn't go too well yesterday, so pray for me. Uh, my dad's really from Kansas City and went to games up there. Um, but Dallas, we all have a bias or a preference, geographic location. Um, how you can be loyal to a team that never wins a game, I don't understand it, but that is your preference and we'll be praying for you. We all have bias or preference. At minimum, laugh at my jokes or say, hey, man, we'll get through it together. iPhone or Android, right? I'll never use an Android. I'm an iPhone user because iPhone, I can plug and play. I have the cloud. Android users will never come to iPhone. Like, we all have a bias or a preference. It exists. Differences exist for our benefit, for God's glory, but we all have bias or preference towards one or the other. 
So now I'm going to take you through an activity. Um, it's with flowers. I always use flowers to understand um, difference and how we respond to difference. Um, and then we'll unpack, um, then we'll get to the question and answers session. So when you see the flowers, um, and I use this in every presentation that I work with at churches, at Christian organizations, everywhere, because it's an easy way to understand difference and how it relates to our social emotional development. So calm, pretty, sweet, it may give you a different reaction when you see the flowers uh, because of an experience that you have with it. Likewise with the bugs, um, a very negative reaction. Um, when I've done this, I've heard ill, gross, uh, uh, we're conditioned uh, to kill these when they're in the house because bugs shouldn't be in the house, right? Because they're different, but they don't align with what, we're, what is our norm. So we have pleasant flowers, we have nasty bugs. But what if we reverse it? So now we have flowers. So what was pleasant for you and your reaction may be negative for me. So I think back to um, the white roses that were at my grandmother's funeral which was very an emotional time for me. So now when I see roses, um, you may think beautiful, positive. I may think sad and be in that social emotional development process. My experience with it now, uh, I don't think the same. And so we treat it differently based on our experiences, emotional experience, our social experience, we all treat it differently. Likewise with the bugs. Um, so don't get me wrong, these are disgusting, they are nasty, uh, but that's just my experience. My sister who's studying to be a veterinarian sees God's beauty in these things and she collects bugs and does all that. That's her experience and that's her perspective. Not right, wrong or indifferent, um, but it's different. So now we have a social emotional process that we're going through to process how we're gonna respond to it. I hope that makes sense to everyone. And so now when we talk about cultural uh, competence, cultural awareness, cultural knowledge, talk about our babies now who are going through social emotional development. So when they're viewing crayons for the first time, they're different colors. When they're viewing animals different for the first time. Different doesn't mean better. Different means an opportunity to learn and grow. So me-centered is what we're all at, right? That's first level. We're aware of me, what I like, what I like to do, what my favorite is, because um, it's me-centered. Cultural knowledge is understanding another person, right? Understanding that I like butter pecan, they like chocolate mint. It's okay, it's both ice cream, it's different for our benefit. It's okay, we can navigate a discussion about ice cream. And then there's sensitivity, right? Not what the world says sensitive. I'm talking about sensitivity to that. I hold up the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ and that I interact with individuals. I don't down an individual because they like chocolate mint ice cream. I don't speak ill of them because they like chocolate mint ice cream. I just tell them my perspective, why I like butter pecan, and I understand their perspective. And at minimum, if we don't agree on chocolate mint ice cream, then we can still be in fellowship and relationship. And then ultimately cultural competence is that I can navigate discussions. Um, I can navigate difference, not losing my authentic self. It's okay to be Christian, but still have a conversation and engage difference. And now I'm better socially, I'm better emotionally, and I'm better spiritually because I understand the value of difference in life. I hope that makes sense to everyone as we kind of walk through that. So here's the call to action. Here's the thing that I want to challenge you uh, as parents, uh, one thing that we're even doing in our own house. Um, so you support your child's social roles by acknowledging what and who uh, is important to them. Uh, we're having a lot of discussions in my house now about difference, uh, how we look different, how we celebrate and worship different, right? Uh, our worship service is different than some of my pastor colleagues. That doesn't mean that it's better. It's just a different way of experiencing God. Um, but the food that we eat in our house is different than the food that is different uh, in our neighbor's house, right? It doesn't mean that it's better. It's just different in a, another opportunity to experience uh, life. And so we don't want to place too many emphasis on one single social role. The only main important one is our Christian identity. But as our babies are growing and developed, they begin to you know, have role models and begin to have people that influence their life. Uh, my babies will not do anything I say, but if Mama and Papa call, they will uh, knock over heaven and earth to get them to do, to do whatever they want to do for Mama and Papa. That's because that social role in their life uh, is important to them. And so they model that behavior, that acting, that feeling, that thinking after Mama and Papa. Uh, and so I want to encourage them to try new and different things and remind them of the other important roles they play in life outside of just 
um, student, right? They are a child. What does that mean to be your child? And celebrate that. What does it mean to be a grandchild? Celebrate that. What does it mean to be a sibling? Um, celebrate that. Cousin, community member, uh, a believer. What does it mean, most importantly, to be a believer? And how does that, how do we navigate that? Even with my three-year-old, we're having discussions on why we go to church and children's church. And when uh, children at daycare who look different and maybe celebrate different holidays, what does that mean? And on his level, understanding that through books like Peacock and the Penguin and through Bible stories and talking about difference, he's able to now have not a full grasp on it, but he's understanding now that he is different and he is loved for the roles that he holds uh, and that we worship Jesus. Um, and he doesn't say Jesus fully clearly yet, but now we've planted seeds. So then when they go to school at Legacy uh, and when we're pouring into them different lessons and teaching them different things, we're able to build and water that seed of growth of celebrating differences, God-given differences. And then that social emotional growth is off the charts because now they're able to engage and navigate through awareness, uh, through the sensitivity and through the competence. Hope that makes sense to everyone. Um, quicker than I... Uh, thought, I kind of talked a little fast there, but now I'm ready to really get to the big part, which is questions that you may have for me. Um, I don't have all the answers, uh, but I will give you my experiences, one from raising children, one from a biblical background. Um, the world has redefined, um, you know, celebrating differences and things of that nature. And so we stand true to our biblical core convictions. But my goal is, is in raising babies and working with schools like Legacy is to make sure that we have a firm grasp on one who, what we are as believers, right? Um, that we are to be celebrated and celebrate each other, right? Because we have been given a gift, um, the gift of grace and the gift of love. But two, how do we navigate diversity and differences in a manner to where we can go and be the light in darkness? We can go as future employees, as future students. I tell my 18, 21 year olds when they come to the college campus, you know, you're gonna have to live your light because public or private, you're gonna be have to stand for something. And so all the investment that we do at a legacy now we get a return on investment when they go out into the world and change the world for the cause of Christ. So I will stop there. Um, my contact information, again, I, I'm associate teaching pastor at Legacy. Uh, Legacy, um, I, must be, I must need to be working at Legacy. Life Change of Faith Christian Fellowship, which is in the Old Abbey, and we're online. So please look us up. Uh, please uh, connect with us. If you need me and want to talk deeper, please reach out to me. Jenna knows how to find me. Um, and I'm excited to answer questions tonight. And I hope you got something from my presentation. I didn't want to be too, too involved, too lecture like it's a college course, but just want to have a dialogue and a conversation. So now I'll turn it back over to Jenna. Thank you for listening to me. Oh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Chapman. That's just fantastic. Um, I love everything you said, just so rich and um, such good reminders. I think diversity really encompasses so much. And so it's really, it's, it's great to hear you talk. Um, and just pick your brain a little bit now with some questions. So I'm going to start with a few, and then Dr. Sneer, if you'll kind of monitor the chat. So if you are home right now, we would love, we have plenty of time. This is a real treat. We have plenty of time for your questions. So uh, do not shy away or hesitate from asking Dr. Chapman anything. Um, I had him in a student assembly actually for the, the older kids, and we had some really in-depth questions that um, he just answered so beautifully. So I encourage you uh, right now, even as I'm speaking, to be chiming in with your uh, questions for Dr. Chapman. All right, so here is the first one that I've got here. And it is, it, this person asks, and you, you, you alluded to this a little bit just right as you were closing, but should the Christian viewpoint of diversity differ from the world's? And if so, how? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so the Christian viewpoint is the viewpoint that I use when I do um, diversity, equity trainings, right? That is my lens for which I see things. Um, the world has their own definition of diversity, equity, and inclusion. In some spaces, uh, you know, uh, government, some uh, colleges, universities, some public schools, you know, they have to abide by that definition. Uh, but I think as believers, we should have our our biblical definition, uh, a full understanding of that, of what it means to be diverse and different uh, and, and live that out. And I believe what comes with that is not only an understanding of diversity and difference, but also how to navigate it. Uh, I think uh, 
Jesus and the woman at the well, uh, the Samaritan woman, how Jews were not supposed to go through Samaria. They didn't like each other, but I believe the Bible, some versions of the Bible say that Jesus had need to go through there. He had need to go to there to uh, a different land, a different place, and speak to a woman that was at the well who was living in sin. Uh, and some scholars actually note that that was the first time that he revealed his true messiahship was to a woman living in sin. So um, yes, our biblical definition of diversity, equity, inclusion, absolutely. But also, I think the Bible gives us instructions on how to navigate that. And at the end of the day, um, judgment and criticism and, and negativity, uh, I don't think is, uh, is a believer's right. Uh, I think we should love and show grace. And if we don't agree, let's live peaceably among each other uh, and continue to be that light and model that behavior uh, that we want uh, ultimately others to, to see. Yeah, that, that's great, Dr. Chapman. Um, Love that, love that answer. And that kind of leads into this next question. Uh, what should we tell our child to do in a situation where he is witnessing racial discrimination against someone but isn't directly involved? So just as a, um, a bystander, you know, how does a parent, you were just mentioning how the Bible does help us navigate. So how would we help our navigate or our, our kid navigate a situation like that where he's experiencing it can be really any discrimination this particular question sure. just about racial yeah yeah um great question so you know the first thing uh, I, I believe one of our greatest tools is and weapons is prayer right um and so we want to pray uh, for the individual on the receiving end that they would get comfort from god we want to pray for the individual who is um doing the, the harm through language or whatever action, right? That they would uh, reconcile uh, and repent and then pray individually that God would give uh, our child the wisdom, even at uh, Suffer Not the Little Children, right? Give them the wisdom to navigate uh, who to tell uh, that story to, whether it's a parent or an authority figure at the school. Uh, and then I think helping the child understand, you know, the walking through what love and grace looks like in our interaction, in our communication, um, it, even if it's not discrimination, bullying for that matter, not being afraid to speak up. If you see something, say something. Uh, and then having a discussion around how uh, even as believers in Christian spaces, we still treat each other wrong sometimes. Uh, it helps to unpack that, to understand that we're all just a prayer away from you know a sin or a bad decision, but God has grace for us. And then the courage to speak up. Uh, if we witness something to say something, because, you know, at the end of the day, we are, uh, the Bible talks about comfort those uh, who, who are mourning. So God comforts us in order to comfort others. And so, uh, and to break that down on a lower level, so I think about my four-year-old and a three-year-old, they recognize wrong. They know when things are not right. And sometimes they, the social emotional piece is not there for them to express that. And so as a parent, you want to talk them through, you know, what did they see? You know, what did they experience? How did it make them feel? Because in that moment, there may be a feeling that they have that they can't quite articulate. Um, and so you want to help them kind of understand that and, and walk through that um, because the, the the most challenging thing we can do is allow them to experience something and we not unpack it yeah. with the lens of, as believers, one, but two, that social emotional piece because then they may carry that with them as baggage um, and then not feel completely like they, they got in trouble because they said something or they didn't say something or didn't say the right thing. So we want to create an environment to where they feel uh, free to express themselves. And then absolutely always 100% time, we want to pray uh, that God will give us wisdom and the Holy Spirit will lead and guide us in those discussions, in those uh, scenarios. Yeah, it's fantastic. So true. And I've found in my experience, honestly, just the courage. I mean, that's a message I give kids as well. And just the courage to be that first one, because typically others follow, you know, there, there's an uncomfortable atmosphere around that a lot of times that if you're the if you were the courageous one then you'll just it unleashes everyone else to kind of chime in with you so so um yeah definitely that's that's a that's a wise message for us lana what do you have over there for questions what do you have for your q a's yeah i have a, a great question which i'm, I'm glad someone asked this because it fits in a little bit with some of the things that i see working at um the lower campus and that in a, a world today where it's, it's, you know, we are all up against um, battles of being different in one way or the other. And our kids are definitely, you know, having to struggle with that and standing out. Um, so how do we help our kids, uh, you know, to be a penguin or a peacock 
and develop that sense of social confidence that you talked about mm -hmm. so that when bias does come at them, you know, that they have the social confidence to stand up. You know, we don't, we're not raising kids right now that find that it, it's definitely attractive to be different. Right. So how, what practical ways to raise kids that can be peacocks? Yeah, um, and so, you know, I think back to my own experience, you know, and I tell the story how I didn't want to be in ministry, I didn't want to be a pastor, um, and, you know, I was at church every day of the week, it seemed like, and so I was afraid to live that out, um, and so I think one of the things that we can do is really engage with um, our children and understand uh, where they're at um, and celebrate them. Uh, when um, I celebrate my babies um, in, in a way that they feel like I celebrate, that they're, they're encouraged by, uh, daddy is celebrating me in this individual moment of my individual uh, peacock moment, that kind of builds their, their love tank, if you will, for lack of a better word, Gary Chapman, love languages, their love tank, so where they feel more bold in who they are. And so uh, when my four-year-old says, hey, at lunch at daycare, I decided to pray, well, that only comes from constantly doing it and encouraging him at home. And when we go to other out publicly and we encourage him, so it builds in that tank of encouragement to where it builds that boldness up in him to, to do that. And then I think the second piece too is communication, having that communication and that dialogue and constantly reaffirming your children that God created them just the way that he wanted them to be and reaffirming them. Now, I know babies need to constantly hear you know, that affirmation uh, that they that they are loved, that they are uh, who they are, and God created them that way. And then I think again, it feels that encouragement take for them to be bold in other settings. Um, there are times now in my life to where, and I miss opportunities to you know to tell people that I'm a pastor, that I serve here, that I do that. Uh, and then I, it's like a kick me moment, like ah, I should have been more bold in that moment. And again, that's just that social pressure. Do I say it here? Do I not say it here? So I think we're constantly trying to feel that encouragement take in order to be bold, uh, one with our Christian identity and our other social identities. Um, you know, I wore suits in high school uh, and people made fun of me because, you know, I wasn't athletic. Um, and that was who I was, right? And it's probably the, the budding pastor in me, right? The budding Baptist preacher in me. But I didn't understand how to navigate that and thought I was doing something wrong when actually I'm doing something right. I'm being true to who I am. And now in hindsight, as many people ask me, why am I wearing a suit? That could have been a ministry opportunity. But now I didn't think of it because I was so caught on uh, what I was doing wrong instead of what I was doing right. I love that, I love that uh, tank that you're talking about, the encouragement tank. That's definitely something that it's a practical thing for our parents. Um, another good question is, how do we help our kids walk through loving each other and loving others and others that have diverse beliefs without compromising their own beliefs and standards? Dr. Chapman, you'll need to unmute. There we go. Okay, there we go. Um, good question. So I think um, the first thing is, is we have to uh, biblically educate our children, right? Um, and it's, it's a lost art now, but Sunday school is what they called it when I was growing up, right? Uh, and it was, you know, uh, um, vacation Bible school to where not only our parents were religious, biblically teaching us at home when we were learning it at church and we were learning the word of God, uh, so I think that's the first step is make sure that our children are biblically educated. Um, and then we need to make them aware of what they're going to encounter uh, in the world, right? Um, the Bible talks about there come a time when they will turn from sound doctrine. You know, my, my children are in public schools for school ISD. And I tell them, like, here's what you're going to encounter. So that way, when you encounter it, um, you're not shell-shocked or surprised by it. And here is what um, that particular identity is. Here is what their parents have decided for them. Here's what they believe, that particular religion. Uh, and here's why what we believe, what we believe. Uh, and so I think education is one piece, but then empowerment is the other piece. And making sure, so yeah, you're educated. Um, you know, there's several Muslim families that live on our street. Um, great, great neighbors. They're educated on that they have a different faith um, and they believe something different. Uh, one thing in our house that we will not do is we will not, you know, disrespect them because they believe different than us. We will not treat them badly because they believe different than us. You can still play with them, uh, but here's what we believe and here's why we believe it. And we constantly have that conversation, um, constantly, almost weekly, to reaffirm what we believe through diff different methods, right? Through um, do Bible study, 
um, through uh, listening to daddy's sermons, right? We constantly reaffirm what we believe in different methods. Again, those people who influence social identities, mama and papa are talking about it, right? And so now I have a culturally uh, competent child who's able to play and not pick up any of those things. And now we create an environment to where they can come to me and ask me questions if they don't understand, or, hey, dad, I'm struggling with this, my 13-year-old, 11-year-old, I'm struggling understanding this. They were talking about this, so help me understand how that aligns with our faith, because it's a, a it's basically an apologetics. How do we defend our faith and talk about it? Um, so that's the process. Uh, I don't know if that's the, the best answer or the right answer, but that's just how we kind of navigated it. Um, expose them, teach them early on. This is the difference that you're going to encounter in different environments. Uh, when I would recruit uh, students, Christian students, to OU, which is a public school, I would tell them, here's what you're going to encounter in philosophy 101. They're going to tell you your God is not real. Now, you have to have the class to graduate. you got to pass it with an A because we want to be excellent in all that we do. But I want you to be aware of what you're going into so that way you can already be not shell-shocked or surprised when you get there and then you can navigate it more appropriately because you've been educated. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think that that's a great answer. It's so that combination of being able to speak truth wrapped up in lots of love. It's, it's the example of Christ. Um, another question is, um, many whites, and we're starting to see that many Caucasians begin are beginning to push back when they're made to feel guilty for the sins of their ancestors. We're talking about especially uh, systematic sins like slavery. Um, how do you help them deal with these feelings in a more positive way so there's not that defensive nature? Yeah, um, and so in my approach, um, and you all know me, um, and uh, Bill McGee knows me as well, and my approach has always been through love uh, and grace, right? No one sin is greater than the other. And so when we come from a Christian perspective, sin is sin, right? Um, and whoever committed the sin is a sinner regardless, but God is a God of grace and love. And so when we talk about, you know, these uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, kingdom unity, kingdom diversity programs, the first thing is let us make sure that we're on the same page spiritually and agree on the basics, that we're all sinners saved by grace through faith, and that there's an opportunity for reconciliation with uh, living peaceably among brethren, right? How good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together. Um, so that's the first piece. The second piece is open dialogue. Um, I, you catch more flies with honey than you do vinegar. And so I think we have to have open dialogue. Um, the things that I am the, the transgressor of, I will hold to be accountable for and apologize for. But think the, the sins of my father, I'm not going to apologize for because I'm not my father. Uh, I'll be aware of them, but I won't apologize for them. And I may be aware of the, the harm that they may have caused. Um, but all I can do is change moving forward. And we can change moving forward by being in dialogue. So I fully recognize the sin. I fully recognize the sinner. But how do we move forward in a, in a concerted effort for the glory of God, for brethren to dwell together? And I think that's just, just open communication and dialogue. Um, it, it's hurtful sometimes. Um, it, it, it's painful because we're reliving experiences. Um, but that pushback or, or that, that guilt that exists, I think that is dangerous sometimes because it kind of creates an opportunity for uh, to be turned off and to turn away from truly digging in to deal with the issue so we can reconcile. Uh, and the truth of the matter is we all have things uh, that we've done and that we said uh, that we need to be accountable for, whether it's my ancestors or whether it was me, uh, let's just look in the mirror, uh, let's be accountable for our actions, and then let's press forward, one, for the glory of God, and two, for the benefit of each other. So I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay, I've got one more question. We live somewhat in a, a, a bit of a bubble. Um, it's not really, if we get outside of ourselves, there is diversity around us. But we do have to almost go seek it sometimes, I think. So what are some practical ways that you uh, suggest surrounding our kids with more diversity so that they have that opportunity for that social and emotional growth? Yeah, so, you know, practical ways, um, it, it's the preacher in me. So one is, you know, go visit a different church that doesn't look like yours, right? Um, they're on Main Street alone. I think there's 10 different churches, you know, Help Fellowship, First Baptist, Frisco, uh, Life Changing Faith, right? Go visit a different church. I firmly believe any church that's open in the name of Jesus Christ and has our you know, line of core convictions, because not everybody who cries, Lord, Lord, will, is saved, but do your research and go visit a different church. If you've never been to an African-American church, 
go visit an African-American church or go to a Hispanic service, even all the way down, if we take race out of it, go to the traditional service versus the contemporary, right? Um, I love my traditional saints who sing from the hymns, right? Because there's something about the, those hymns and those hymn books that they love so much, right? Um, the contemporary service, yes, it's more upbeat, it's more engaging, but that's the difference that God gets value out of from us worshiping him. So uh, seek that out. And then I think start in your network. Um, you know, COVID has hindered a lot of our opportunities to connect, um, but look around your dinner table, you know, look around your friend group. If you don't necessarily have diversity, not just racial diversity, but if you don't have diversity kind of in that friend group and that kind of core group, um, practical ways is, you know, seek, seek that out through church friends uh, and through uh, other social organizations and opportunities. Uh, and again, don't just limit it to race. Um, look at other geographic locations. Uh, look at other opportunities to really see God's beauty of diversity. Um, and another way is mission trips, right? That is the big way the church has tried to embrace diversity is mission trips, that we send people abroad to Africa, uh, to these other countries. How about we go on a mission trip right in our own city, right? How about we just go across to the other side of town? Um, my wife's originally from South Dallas, DeSoto. If you go down there, it's predominantly African-American, right? And there's some great churches down there. And there's some white churches down there as well who have more engaged uh, across racial lines. And that way you can feel comfortable kind of around, there's the preference around those that are your race, but also kind of get outside your comfort zone and be exposed to others as well. And then what you find is that we all love Jesus and we just worship him in different ways and have different language for different words that all mean the same thing. So hopefully that answers some of the practical ways. Very good. That, yes, very helpful. Because uh, I, I think we do get kind of complacent and comfortable and we just don't go outside of our environment. So that's, that's a good reminder. We need to do that. Okay, I'm going to pass it back to Jenna. Yeah, thank you, Lana. Um, well, that's, that's fantastic, Dr. Chapman. I love how you how you talk about that. And I think it, it is challenging as, as parents sometimes, you know, in our demographic to really to really give our kids a, a rich experience of diversity, but um, definitely in God's plan. And uh, there are ways to do that. And I love, I love your creativity on some of that. So this is switching gears just a little bit. Um, but, but as far as, you know, we've been talking about the differences and the, the peacock versus the penguins, which by the way, I did have a parent ask, what was the name of that book? So exactly the, yeah. Yeah, The Peacock in the Land of Penguins. The Peacock in the Land of Penguins. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so we wanted, I wanted just to mention that before I forgot. I want that parent to have an opportunity and other parents to get that book. Um, and um, this question is switching gears a little bit, but as we talk about being different and being strong in um, who you are and who God created you to be, you know, it encompasses so much. And We've had a question come across that deals with a, a, a learning difference. Absolutely. So this person's daughter has severe dyslexia and other learning disabilities and is seen and treated differently by her friends and classmates because of it. How can we as parents help her through that? Yeah, um, and you know, and that's a great point that I want to reiterate is that you know when we talk about difference. Uh, we're not just talking about race, right, or, or class, uh, or, or gender, right, we're talking about learning differences, we're talking about where you were raised, or so where I was raised, like, there's so many differences, birthing order is a difference, right, career field is a difference, um, and so it, it's, it's broad, um, so with learning difference, uh, again, I go back to the encouragement tank, uh, one, you want to make sure that your child uh, feels valued, loved, and appreciated, um, and that there's nothing wrong with them, right, like, they're, there's oftentimes this connotation that because I learn differently, something is wrong with me. Uh, no, that doesn't make you weird. It doesn't make you um, less than. That actually makes you unique uh, and, and, and special. You know, I'm a visual learner, and so uh, I, I take massive notes and I write questions down, and I have to pause to actually see it before I respond. Um, early on in education, you know, I thought I was different because everybody could just read and zip through things. Well, no, my parents taught me that I'm uniquely made wonderfully made in his image and that's for his glory and so the first thing is that encouragement take feel that encouragement take of your child let them know that they are not less than they're not discounted uh, that they are perfect in in the ways that they were created uh, that encouragement take so secondly i think is making sure that uh, they um, feel comfortable 
Uh, and it's a process, but feel comfortable with how they learn, with who they are. We've kind of talked at length about this, but, you know, making sure that they advocate for themselves. And so, you know, it's okay to ask to repeat, you know, the, the instructions for the test if I didn't get it the first time. It's okay to ask for the support systems or the accommodations that I need to learn. There's nothing wrong with that because at the end of the day, um, a true believer, uh, particularly in a space for believers in Christian education, should be running to help you, running to help you be successful. Uh, there should not be any judgment at all from authority figures. Now, as it relates to peer-to-peer, -peer, other students and things of that nature, kids don't know what they don't know, and kids can be mean, uh, and kids are just ignorant. And so I think in those moments, uh, depending upon the age, uh, there's an opportunity for education and understanding, but I'm willing to bet I can go in the classroom uh, from kindergarten to 12th grade, of about 20 to 24 kids, I can find something different about each one of them, and I have a choice. I could make fun and make them feel really bad about it, or I could celebrate and show them how unique it is and how it plays a role in God's world and in that classroom. And so I think that's the other piece is make sure that, yes, they may have dyslexia, but that doesn't mean that they're discounted. That means God loves them and that there's some great things that God has in store for them by way of that learning uh, difference that they have. Yes, love that. Exactly. Um, letting God just take that and use that and, and because he has created them in that unique way. Um, I think that's that's wonderful. Um, and I know like in our offices, Lana and I encounter this where, where a student comes in and just feels less than for some reason. And our message is always, you know, look at all these things God has given you that this person that this friend doesn't have, you know, you may have challenges with dyslexia, but um, we all have challenges. So those, those look different. Um, and, and like you said, you know, there's no one greater uh, challenge than the other. Like we're, it's, it's all equal in God's eyes. So just embracing who, who we are and our identity in him. Um, last question. You've been so gracious to answer all these questions. Yeah, I feel like we're just firing at you, but we just don't get the opportunity always to get in this much Q&A. So it's good. Um, all right, so I have one here. My child is four years old okay. in early ed. How do I communicate your message to her on a level she understands? So maybe with the little, you've, you've yeah. hinted that a little bit, but I know you've had, you know, you, you've raised five, so um, you've been there. Like um, when, when our words might not make total sense, you know, developmentally to them, how would we, how would we get this message across to the littles? Yeah, um, so one way that I do for the littles, uh, presenting my, my littles, um, is, you know, I use Dr. Seuss books. I use books that show difference because um, it's, it's broken down in terms that they can understand. But I also, um, and I think sometimes we, uh, we take for granted the actual um, intelligence of our baby. So, you know, I think about my four-year-old, you know, he's noticing difference now that he has darker skin than Ethan at school. And so he's, you know, and he's innocent about it. And that innocence, I want him to keep, but also I try to walk alongside him that no one else breaks that innocence. That yes, God created Ethan with, you know, white skin and created you with dark skin. That doesn't mean Ethan is better than you. That means Ethan is different and God loves Ethan just like you. And so how should we treat Ethan? And he says, well, I love Ethan. That's my buddy. And I said, great. And so we shouldn't treat Ethan any different because his skin is different. And he's like, no. And so I think having those discussions and you think, you know, here's a PhD having a discussion with a four-year-old, but in his mind, it's clicking and all those those. So I think you just have to find those opportunities, even difference with, you know, Brussels sprouts versus broccoli, right? God made them both, right? And therefore are good, but they are different. Uh, and you may not like one because it's a Brussels sprout, but at the end of the day, God created it for our good. And so find difference and opportunities in different things. Um, don't put so much uh, weight on, you know, the, the higher level stuff that we are able to negotiate out and talk out, you know, race, class, gender, economics, but find ways um, to where they can understand with the vegetables, with the crayons, uh, with friends in the athletic leagues and things of that nature and have the honest conversation. Uh, and, that, and that for me is planting seeds. They won't fully grasp and fully understand, but then as they go to school, as they go to children's church, as they begin to have all these other things come in, the social emotional begins to grow, that seed begins to grow. And now they'll, they'll actually eat their Brussels sprouts because they know they're an equal opportunity vegetable that God created for his glory and for mother to be happy. Yes, amen to Brussels yeah. sprouts. 
So that, that's Amen. good. And I think it's all about, like you're saying, just having a conversation, just getting a conversation started. And um, then that way they're free to come to you all throughout their, their um, growing up years. Exactly. With this that's good. Topic. And it's not taboo and it's not, um, it's not something that they don't feel comfortable talking about. So I think that's wonderful. Um, well, we're about to wrap up. I, I'm noticing some strong themes in your message and, and I love that. I love how you talk about um, helping our kids have a strong identity. I think it all starts with a strong identity themselves um, to be able to accept others' differences and even celebrate them, which is ideally at Legacy. You know, we have a motto, Imago Day, which is made in the image of God. And then Mr. McGee has just drilled that into parents' yes. heads, our heads. And that is what it's all about. We are all made in the image of God. So, so we need to learn to celebrate and love each other and, and um, speak the truth in love, like you said. You. Speak the truth, but in love. Um, and so that when you are, when you are faced with a, a issue where you're seeing a diversity, a, you know, that's not handled correctly, that you right. educate as opposed to um, turn off. So um, I want to just briefly, we just have a minute or so, but I want to just briefly point you to um, parents, you have within the resources I've given you on an email, the last email I sent you, we include in our, in our um, event, the huddle up package. And this is a debriefing for you and your spouse. So you can look over those questions. I've listed them out here. They're in that last email, as I've said, um, and talk about these things with your spouse, get this out there. You know, what are we doing to get this conversation started with our children? And Lana, Dr. Sneer, I'll just put a plug in for that. She reads a fantastic book in there this time. She videos herself and it's just, it's amazing. I love it. It's a bedtime story for your kids. So you can go put that on for your kids right now. It's called, We Are All a Wonder. And it's just a beautiful little story about accepting each other's differences. I'm gonna close this in prayer quickly. We are so thankful for you, Dr. Chapman. You are thank a you favorite all. of ours. We love you at Legacy. Yes. Please come back. And I love you back. Absolutely, thank you. thank you. Father, we just give this night to you, Lord. And we thank you for the message. And the, like Dr. Chapman said, the seeds you've planted, you've given us a lot to think about. Help us as parents and as families to just um, represent you well and to represent uh, your diversity to our children so that they embrace others and see them as being made in your image, Father. Um, and, and the way we treat them is the way we are in, uh, treating you. You say as you, you, that we treat them, um, that it, it we give them a cup of cold water. It's like doing the same for you. So Father, I just pray that we, um, we are strong, uh, believers when it comes to this topic and that you I know you will equip us to deal with our kids in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. well we are just grateful for you joining us um, please come to our next pep talk and we will see you then